Hello, and welcome to Agrosive Physics. Today is day 41, and what we're going to look at today is free body diagrams. Now, free body diagrams are a way for us to take a givens list and make it a visual representation. And in fact, what we're going to do is take an object and draw all the forces acting on it. Now, a free body diagram takes the object and separates it from the rest of the world. So all we do is look at a single object at a time. We could have situations where objects are connected with ropes or perhaps they are overhanging uh, with a pulley. And in that case, we're going to have multiple objects involved. But each object will have all of their forces acting on them separate from the others. Now, some of the forces may be common, and that's because of Newton's third law. But what I want to look at is drawing a uh, basically a vector diagram of all the forces acting on an object. Now, the way we define free body diagram, it's a visual representation of all the forces acting on an object. Each object in the problem will have a unique uh, diagram. And we're going to list all the forces on it. And if we know the values, we're going to write them in. If we don't know the values, we may have to calculate them. Inside the box, we're going to put the mass of the object. And outside the box, not connected to it, we'll put the direction of motion. And typically, what we'll do is use the direction of motion of the object as our positive, And then backwards would be negative. That will allow us to use friction um, in problems in order to solve for a negative force. So we're going to sum up all the forces in the x direction, sum up all the forces in the y direction, and then solve for whatever unknowns we may have. Now, free body diagrams are um, they, they were going to be simple at first, but then become more complex. And what we're going to be able to do with them is effectively use them to solve F equals MA. Free body diagrams, for our purposes, allow us to typically either solve for the acceleration in a problem or solve for any unknown force in a problem. An object may have multiple forces. It may have four, five, or six forces acting on it. We'll start with a few. Um, some are going to be common to almost every problem. And ones that are in the direction of motion will affect the motion. Ones that are perpendicular to the motion may or may not affect the motion. In fact, if an object's moving along a table, there are still going to be vertical forces, namely the table pushing up and gravity pulling down. But if it only moves sideways, those forces will not have any effect on the problem. In fact, because they're perpendicular to the motion, they will be independent. So what I want to look at is a couple of sample problems at this point. Uh, we'll take the whiteboard out, and we'll look at um, two samples. We'll have pushing a book across a table, um, where someone is just pushing the book sideways across the table. And then we'll look at a person pulling a wagon. Um, you know, along level ground. Ultimately, what we'll look at as we move forward, once we get the hang of uh, horizontal or vertical forces, uh, we'll deal with ones that are at angles. And once we deal with ones that are angles, we'll actually take the surface itself and angle the surface. And that will be a little more complex. But once again, this is a situation where we take, um, at, at first, simple problems, basic problems, and then add layers of complexity um, as we move forward so that you're able to solve more realistic problems and problems that are more complex. So right now we'll look at a couple of sample problems with free body diagrams, free being my favorite four letter F word. And what we'll do is look at all the forces acting on a bush book being pushed across a table. And then finally, we'll look at uh, a person pulling a wagon um, across level ground. So we'll look at the whiteboard now, and we'll start our discussion of how to use free body diagrams to solve problems. Thank you. So free body diagrams are a visual representation of all the forces acting on an object. Now, the first thing to note is that we're always going to use a rectangle. And that's so that if we have an oddly shaped object, it may look like there are forces acting on it that don't actually occur. If we always stick to the same shape for everything, then it's going to allow us to visualize the forces without being um, concerned with our artistic ability. Besides, my artistic ability, as you've seen, is pretty weak. So this makes it easier for me as well. 
Now what we're going to do is we're going to push a, bo a book across the table. So if this is the book, I'm going to push it from the side across the table. And it's going to move to the right. Now one thing to note is we draw a free body because it's only the one object involved. So we're only going to draw, in this case, the book. Now what forces act on the book? Well, first, it's going to be the force that I apply to it to the right. So we usually call that FA or F applied. FA for short. And there'll be a number for that. It could be 10 newtons, it could be 20 newtons, it could be anything. Now, if we're near the Earth's surface and there's contact between the table and the book, there's going to be a backward force. And that's typically friction. And we'll talk about friction a little later. Now, there can be some problems where friction is, is ignored, and in which case it'll say it in the problem, and we'll delete that. That'll be it right out of there. Any object near the Earth's surface, it's going to experience a force due to gravity. Now, I call it FG. Some of you will want to call it W for weight. If you use the W, that's fine. The equation is W equals mg to calculate it. And for FG, it's FG equals mg as well. The reason we use g is because that represents 9.8 meters per second squared. So that's your acceleration of gravity. The negative sign is not included in this g now. And that's why I like to use the g here, because the direction of the force is already included on in the diagram. We already have the downward arrow. Now, in addition to the downward force of gravity, the table is pushing back because of Newton's third law. So for now, we're going to call it f t, and I'll just call it f-table. We're going to have a fancy name for that pretty soon. There's our foreshadowing for the week. Now, with that being said, the last thing we're going to want to do is put the mass of the book inside the box. And that way, you always have the mass in the right spot. Some problems will give you kilograms, which you'd put inside the box. Other problems will give you the weight, and that would be in newtons outside the box. So if you get used to this process by which we always put the mass inside the box and the weight outside the box, you won't get confused. A problem that gives you n will allow you to put it for the arrow down. And an, a problem that gives you the mass, m, you'd put it inside the box. Now finally, all we do is put the direction, and I'm going to write it to the, um, to the right in this case. And I'm going to have it have an acceleration. It could be a constant velocity as well. But the arrow for the direction of motion is always outside the box, not touching. Only forces will touch the free body diagram. And that's how you draw a free body diagram. If we're pulling a wagon, what would the free body diagram look like? Well, the first thing you need to know is the mass of the wagon and the occupants inside the wagon. So you put that in the middle. That could be 5 kilograms, 10 kilograms, or whatever. Needs to be in kilograms, though. So if you're given a weight, for example, that would represent the force of gravity on the object. Now, the weight is going to be measured in newtons. Every problem is going to involve force of gravity and mass. So for free body diagrams, you might as well start with those two, even if the problem is sideways. Now, in this case, you're going to be pulling a wagon, so chances are there's going to be a force along a handle at an angle upward. Now, although that's not a very straight line, what we need to do is resolve that vector into its components. So this may be the force applied, but then we'd need to find the x and y components by doing f a cos theta and f a sine theta. There would be a force from the ground. And then chances are there'd be some friction. Now, when you are doing the problem solving of this, you'd end up with two equations. And the reason we broke this applied force into components, and let me just get rid of it, because effectively the, that force at an angle just turned into two forces. One is acting up along the y direction, f a sine theta. I'm just going to move it over there. And then the other one is moving in the x direction. 
So even though we don't have numbers yet, we could still set up an equation that governs the two directions. And in fact, what you'd have if you sum the forces in the x direction, the equation would look like the following. F a cosine theta, that's all the positive arrows, minus friction equals, and you set your forces equal to ma. Now, we don't know numbers, but if we had some numbers, we'd be able to solve for whatever the unknown happened to be. If we do the same thing in the y direction, we actually have three forces now. We have F A sine theta plus F ground, and I'm going to spell out ground because otherwise it'll look like gravity, minus F G, which is gravity, and that equals M A. Now, 90% of the problems we do are going to be sideways. So the up and down motion will be zero. So this A term will actually cancel out and become a zero. So this whole term for most, and I'll start, for most problems will end up being zero. So as long as you know gravity and maybe FA, you'll be able to find the force of the ground or something like that. Um, I guess you could even work backwards and find what the gravitational attraction of the Earth is and then determine the mass from that. But either way, the free body diagram would have one, two, three, four forces at first because we had the one at an angle. And when we break that vector into components, it turns into an extra one. So we end up with five total. One, two, three, four, five.